Today, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky accuses Russia of planting mines at a hydroelectric dam near Kherson. We look in detail at the diplomacy and technicalities of the September run-in between a British spy plane with Russian fighter jets. And we talk about what life is like for a soldier in winter. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Ukraine can win, Ukraine must win, and Ukraine will win. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Friday, the 21st of October, day 240. And today, I'm joined by Associate Editor Dominic Nichols and our Assistant Comment Editor, Francis Sternley. I started by asking Dom for the latest news from Ukraine. Well, hi, David. Hi, everybody. Great to, uh, great to be back after a few days away. Essential beer and boating activity. Um, it's been quite quite sort of air air based in the last 24 hours so a lot of missile strikes uh Kharkiv Kharkiv and Zaporizhia in particular um Kharkiv was hit uh by a number of missiles including one hit a medical facility then the, the city's mayor said um other um pieces of infrastructure and industrial sites were struck i mean again s- nothing's changed since i've been away seemingly no no pattern to this other than russia is trying to terrorize the the civilian population in, in the hope of breaking the political will, Ukraine's political will to uh, to carry on and the international international will to continue su- to support Ukraine. Um, elsewhere, there were there were strikes in, in Zaporizhia um, and uh, there's the ever present danger of the of the dam um, in well, just southwest of, of Zaporizhia. Uh, the President Zelensky said last night that, that Russia has has placed um, mines on on the dam. Russia is saying that that Ukraine intends to intends to do something to the dam, which I think is is rubbish. Um, Ukraine, as I said, President Zelensky is saying that that there are mines on the dam and that Russia is making preparations to blow that. Um, if I mean the dam is about forty k's east of the city of Hezon. Um, if that were to go, then there'd just be a horrific environmental disaster. There would be many, many people killed down downstream. Um, it would, it would stop the the Ukrainian advance. Uh, not that they're yet up to the river to cross it to then uh, to then push further south into Herzon Oblast, but um, that would put paid to that for for some time. So there there would be military advantage through Russia's eyes. They would see it as such. But it, I mean, it, it would it would then mean that they have no option. Russia has no option then of, of getting over the river and and pushing west through Mykolaiv and Odessa and all those other fanciful dreams that they've that they've had. So the threat to the dam there, and and uh, by extension the water through the city itself still exists. Um, but so nothing has happened there directly in the last twenty four hours. But uh, yeah, a lot of missile strikes still across the uh, across the the country. I mean, they're now installing. Uh, they're trying to get back to some sort of normal life in Kharkiv, to the north or northeast of the country, the sec- second city in Ukraine, um, installing concrete uh, shelters at bus stops so people can try to go about normal life with some degree of protection should the air raid sirens go off again. Um, and, and reports are that, I mean, you said you heard yesterday from Sergio, he was saying that 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 when these alarms go off because the the drones they're now using, particularly these Iranian drones then the air raid alarms go off and it's not like towards the start of the war when it was sort of go inside for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour when the threat's passed because these things can loiter and, and you know, where they how many are coming. They're so cheap, they've got them in plentiful supply. These air raid alarms can last for hours. So you, you have to go about your daily life. Otherwise, it's just, um, you know, yeah. with with a huge degree of caution, of course, but uh, you should not, not give in to Russia's terrorism. Um, but in order to do so, you need such structures like this, these concrete shelters at, at, at bus stops. So preparations are being made for long uh, continuing air war. Um, and uh, and yeah, yet more missile strikes with seemingly no, no military value from Russia. Thanks, Tom. Can I just ask you a little bit about um, the British um, Ministry of Defence's update today on the movement of Russian troops uh, into Belarus? And what, what are they saying and what do we think is happening? Yeah, so today's UK defence intelligence um, output, the da- daily output, 
Um, generally pretty good. Um, some much much better than others, but 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 pretty good at, at relaying information and more importantly the analysis of it, which you can then either agree or disagree with, but based on other sources that we should all be all be reaching out for. Um, but yeah, so today they're saying that this this Russo Belarusian force of seventy thousand people that we that we heard um, President Lukashenko and and um, and Putin talk about a few days ago. I mean, supposedly. Uh, fifteen thousand Russians going to be going to be part of this. I mean, they they just simply haven't got the, they've not got the, the combat units, um, combat ready to do this. They probably haven't got the numbers. They certainly not got the coherent organisation that they can sort of dock into this larger Belarusian force to threaten Ukraine's um, northern border. So again, sort of pie in the sky. It it is. Uh, one of those areas, remember some months ago we were talking about the potential for a, a Russian amphibious assault on Odessa. I didn't really think it was uh, very likely. Um, it would have been at great cost. That wouldn't have troubled Russia, but I think they would have lost a lot of ships doing it. But at the time we were making the point that that's not always the, the, the sole reason you do it. You, you threaten these things. So Russia might threaten an amphibious assault to Odessa. This Belarusian Russian force of seventy odd thousand, however many are forces held in uh, in Belarus, are not necessarily there um, t- to plan an attack. But Ukraine have to ask themselves the question: Do they take the eye off the ball? Do they take? Do they? Do they decide that it's a feint and a bluff, and move very uh, scarce and important troops and resources elsewhere, or do they hold some forces at readiness near there uh, to to see off any? any assault should it come and and that is what what i think is happening here i think that they that russia and belarus are are trying to threaten a new axis up to the north bearing in mind it didn't it really didn't go well last time you know a few months ago when they they were just pushed back um it's going to be even harder now that uh, i think ukraine will have learned from that and winter's approaching so those routes of advance through the forests up there are going to be even fewer so I think that the aim here is to try and tie down some Ukrainian resources without seriously threatening an advance. We're probably hearing about it because uh, Belarus will, will be quite vocal in their support for this because so, they don't have to do anything. They just have to say that they're there and they're available and they give it their full, their full hearted uh, support for this for this plan. Um, I mean, Belarus, uh, Lukashenko has been very, very lukewarm in his overt uh, military support for Putin's uh, adventure here, um, so so something like this, which is a paper tiger, I think they'd be quite quite willing to put their name to and lean in and say, oh yeah, it's absolutely oh, fearsome. We've got all these things, it's got missiles and everything. So of course they're going to say all that because they don't actually have to do anything. Um, however, you know, Ukraine cannot cannot not for me to tell them what they can and can't do, but I'd be very surprised if they decide it's all a complete bluff and they need not tie up some resource, both personnel on the ground and also. Um, surveillance resource to keep to keep an eye physically keep an eye on the border and see what's coming from up there so so i think it's there to tie down resource rather than seriously threaten another axis of advance for russia thanks dom um francis can i just come to you i know you had quite a few thoughts around some of the historical contexts um uh when we were talking about the dam earlier can you talk us talk our listeners through um the kind of things you've been reading and, and your thoughts on that yes thank you david and good afternoon everyone i think As we've spoken about the podcast at length now for several weeks, we knew that as conventional warfare failed for Putin in Ukraine, that he was likely to turn to unconventional warfare. And indeed, I think that we should see this supposed intention to destroy this hydroelectric dam as as part of that. And I think it's very easy to just see this hydroelectric dam as something that is a strategic target. But I just wanted to emphasize for for, for listeners the devastation that the destruction of a dam can wrought. Here in Britain, it's often spoken about the dam busters raids during the Second World War, very significant for, for raising morale here, but we're also significant strategically. But when one reads into those accounts, that the, the destruction that those dams wrought was incredible. And indeed, if one looks at another example from Ukraine itself from 1941, one gets a sense of just how devastating and how horrific such destructive acts can be. So in 1941, as Nazi German troops were sweeping through uh, what was then Soviet-era Ukraine, the secret police, Stalin's secret police, blew up a hydroelectric dam in Zaporizhia, of course, somewhere we know very well from this war, to slow down the Nazi advance. That explosion 
flooded villages along the banks of the Dnipro River. And it killed, and this is staggering, 20,000 to 100,000 civilians. One survivor, and I've been looking into to testimony from the time, said, quote, People were screaming for help. Cows were mooing, pigs were squealing. People were climbing on trees to escape the floods. And indeed, one American journalist at the time, just to give us a sense of how significant this event was, it really a forgotten event of, of the war, Stalin's order to destroy it meant more to the Russians emotionally than it would mean to root for Roosevelt to order the destruction of the Panama Canal. So I just wanted to emphasize just the the scale of of what the as I say the damage that these things can can bring the horrors that Ukraine has already suffered in its past when a dam was destroyed and I mean what's remarkable obviously in that instance is that that destruction was wrought by the Russians on that dam and it killed innocent Ukrainians so Again, another historical precedent, even though in that situation they were fighting the Nazis, of course, rather than the Ukrainians themselves. But as I say, that's a that's a by the by. So I just wanted to to underline that. And so I think this explains, of course, why Zelensky is is saying what he is saying about the significance of this and attempting to d- d- deter from the Russians doing it due to international pressure. Yeah, I think it's another example, however, where if the West was clearer about where its red lines are on these questions of conventional or unconventional warfare, then we we might not be in a situation where Russia is threatening such attacks. Thanks for that, Francis. Francis, can I stay with you? Uh, yesterday on the podcast, as we recorded live, we kept on having to sort of look out of the podcast booth and saw our colleagues gathered around the, the, the televisions here in, in the newsroom at The Telegraph because the British Prime Minister, Liz Truss, resigned. And we, we explored a little bit about what that might mean for Britain's support uh, to Ukraine. But ev- events are moving at, at an absolute well, at an incredible speed here. Can you just update us to where we are? I'm sure quite a few of our Ukrainian listeners will be interested to hear what, what this might mean for them. Yes, well, as you say, yesterday's episode was was quite remarkable, with with history being being made every every minute. It felt, um, but yes, Liz Truss was forced to resign, as you say. Uh, basically, her party became ungovernable and was was unwilling to listen to to her as leader. She becomes the shortest prime minister since the foundation of the office, as an interesting um, fact. Uh, I think George Canning, who lasted 117 days in 1827, I think, um, w- uh, held the record up until her, and he actually died in office in Downing Street. So um, this is really unprecedented, just to give our internationalists a sense of how unusual this is in Britain for, for a prime minister to last as short as, as, as she did. I talked about her significance in Ukraine yesterday, but the significance now, of course, about who is going to succeed her. Now, it, it, in what is quite a remarkable reversal of fortune, Boris Johnson is now one of the favourites to return to office after, of course, being ousted about three months ago. He has put his name forward. A lot, some people speculated that he would not, but he has. And indeed, there are dozens of members of parliament who are now supporting him in his bid. What's going to happen, in essence, is that the, the, the Conservative Party in the House of Commons is going to put forward two candidates and then one candidate will be chosen. Uh, by the membership in about a 10 day period, about a week period, uh, w- w- who will eventually succeed. Now, the, the big question mark is whether Boris Johnson will get the support of enough MPs to be on the ticket. Rishi Sunak is the favourite. Ben Wallace was going to put himself forward, it was believed, but he has now said that he will not be doing that. Of course, the British Defence Secretary and has said that he is leaning towards backing Boris Johnson. So, As things stand, the most likely outcome is that Boris Johnson will be battling against Rishi Sunak, his former chancellor, for the job of prime minister. There's so many consequences of this if it happens, and I'm not going to unpack all of them now. But of course, the big one is Ukraine. Boris Johnson held as 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 somebody who who understood the significance of Ukraine from the beginning. His support has been steadfast on the country. He's considered a, a hero there, and so of course, many many people in Ukraine are 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 cheering him on. And indeed, an event took place 
yesterday evening where the Ukrainian government hastily deleted a message that was backing Boris Johnson to become prime minister. It was a meme um, themed around the uh, Netflix program Better Call Saul. um, And it had a picture of the character from that, Saul Goodman, uh, holding a cutout of Boris Johnson with the slogan Better Call Boris emblazoned on it. This caused quite a significant backlash, it has to be said, amongst British journalists and politicians. And the post was hastily deleted. But I think it's indicative, isn't it, of of what the Ukrainian government would like to see, which is a return of Boris Johnson to office, which, as I say, is looking far from impossible. If it goes to the membership between Rishi Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson, then I think Boris Johnson will win. Thank you very much for that update, uh, Francis. Can we stay talking about uh, diplomacy for a bit? There's a, there's a few updates I think we need to talk about. Uh, in the US, we mentioned on the podcast this week um, some of the remarks from Republicans who, who suggested that maybe after the midterms, if they win, uh, Ukraine would not enjoy such um, uh, spending commitments. Uh, I, I think, believe the exact phrase was, you know, we we're not going to do a blank check. Um, Francis, can you talk through how President Biden has responded? Well, that's very simply robustly. Uh, He's been, of course, on the campaign trail in the midterms, although interestingly, we read he's not been as prominent on the campaign trail as a sitting president normally would be due to his unpopularity. Um, But he has spoken out about the rival Republicans suggesting that the US funding for Ukraine would be cut after the midterms. He said, quote, "These these guys don't get it. It's a lot bigger than Ukraine. It's Eastern Europe. It's NATO. It's really serious, serious, consequential outcomes. They have no sense of American foreign policy. So very strong remarks from Biden there and indeed indicative of, of, of how many world leaders are interpreting the conflict in Ukraine, more about than just being about Ukraine itself, but the kind of world that we want to live in and the ramifications of, of perceived weakness on Russia. So very noteworthy remarks indeed, I think it's fair to say. Thank you. And in Turkey, a Turkish president, Erdogan, has also made some interesting remarks. Uh, how would you cast them, Francis? Well, just very briefly, because I think it's worth commenting on, of course, Turkey has been, since the beginning of this conflict, something of a, of a mediator. I've spoken in the past about the historical role of, of Istanbul as, as straddling both East and West. And Erdogan has fully embraced that. Of course, Turkey is a NATO member, but it also has had contracts with Russia in the past. And, and, and so it's a complicated relationship. But he's insisted uh, that... Uh, Putin is much softer, that's a direct quote, and is more open to negotiations. And I think that we should see that, that when he says that, so that's indicative of conversations that he's been happening or that his diplomats have been having with Russians. I think it is accurate as well. I think it's fair to say that I think if Putin were offered uh, a, an off-ramp, as it's often articulated, of keeping the annexed territories that that, the, that is currently in Russian-controlled hands, that he would accept that and would, would, would try and uh, consider consolidate his gains. Of course, that would in many ways be a a significant defeat from what his original intention of the war was from the beginning. I think it's worth saying that. But nonetheless, of course, it goes diametrically opposed to to what the Ukrainians wish for all sorts of reasons I've talked about in the past, but also now what the world or the West, should I say, to be more specific, what what Western leaders uh, think needs to happen in Ukraine, which is a a humiliation for Russia and and a a defeat um, where he does not, is not perceived as gaining anything from from the war. And indeed, I think that speaks to Biden's remarks as well. Thank you very much uh, for that, Francis. Dom, can I come to you? We've been talking a bit this week about the uh, about winter, um, winter conditions, autumnal conditions, and soon to be winter conditions uh, in Ukraine and and across Europe. Um, I wanted to ask you because we've obviously touched on the strategic implications, uh, sort of a broad view of what winter means for fighting forces. I wanted to ask you, as a former soldier, what um, being a soldier in the winter actually does feel like. What does it feel like on the ground? Well, pretty cold. <laughs> in a short answer, I mean, just everything, everything slows down. You know, it's like go, just living a normal life in in a cold, hard, biting winter. Well, multiply that by having to work with machinery, which is not only um, using tools and all the rest of it, but you have the you have the physical risk of freezing to metal surfaces, which you've got to take into account of. Um, but also then then fighting it. I mean, it's just everything, everything slows down. Very simply, the the military look at winter and it's a it's a balance between are you are you uh, fighting to survive or surviving to fight? That's it in a in a nutshell. 
Um, generally, you need uh, specialist troops. So in, in the British Armed Forces, we've got the, the Royal Marine Commandos that they're their principal role, or one of their one of their principal roles, is the defence of NATO's northern flank. They work very closely with, with Norwegians in that regard. Um, but I mean, all, all soldiers are trained to a certain degree, and you would like to think equipped to a certain degree to put up with with cold temperatures. But 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 for many of them, for for the majority of the of military forces, it's about um, holding what you've got, staying where you are, defending what you've got. Trying to advance through a cold winter is extremely difficult, which is why. It, why it requires specialist troops mainly. Um, everything slows down depending on the on the meteorological conditions that the aircraft um, either can't fly because the, there's too much um, hoar frost. I seem to remember the term was on the blades of helicopters and around engine intakes. So, you know, it's very dangerous. Um, just all kind of operations are are harder. Um, conversely, if it's if it's one of those uh, those cold, hard, bright blue sky winter days then actually it can make flying a lot easier and can make can make um, operating to a certain degree a bit more straightforward i.e things give off a much larger thermal signature so if you've got equipment that can see um, heat spots uh, of vehicles and and personnel then they're going to show up much more starkly in winter for, for obvious reasons now i mean it'd be really interesting to see here what happens on the on the drone war side of side of life so i think this this conflict although we we saw um Drones, particularly the Barakta, really come to the fore in the um, 2020 Azerbaijan-Armenia conflict. Um, they've they've really come come out in this one. Not only the use of drones, but also the innovation, what you what you can link them to. And I think part of the reason for uh, for the rate of advance. I won't say whether it's slow, slow or fast, but the rate of advance has been that this is very quickly, this war has very quickly become, um, or, or drones have come to the fore here, being able to spot for artillery. Um, and the Ukrainians are innovating at a massive pace, and they're not, if at all, for, if they are at all further on from you know, other allies, NATO partners, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and I'm not suggesting they are for one moment, but they're, they're not. They're not far behind. So, so the West are learning, or, or non non Ukrainian partners are learning just as much uh, from this war about how to use drones as uh, as Ukraine is, and you can put it into practice. So, I think that all these lessons of of can you? We've seen drones being adapted to drop grenades, for example. Um, are we going to see them uh, routinely have thermal cameras on, uh, which are you know, a bit, bit heavier, uh, take a bit, bit more um, technical wizardry, so are, are fewer in number? Are they going to come to the fore through winter? We don't, we don't know yet. We've never really, we've sort of not not done this before. This this will be new for all of us. So winter just slows every everything down. Um, it makes all things harder. I mean, whilst the the uh, in many ways, once you get through the Rasputista, which is the, when the the sort of transition into and out of winter, when the the road surfaces and the fields just turn to that really thick, cloying mud that we saw in the first few weeks of this war, which which can just swallow, as we saw, swallow armored vehicles. Um, once that hardens up, then it can be it can be easier for armored vehicles to move across. Uh, frozen surfaces however you've got the attendant risk of of sticking out you know thermally as as i've just described but just the the impact on on humans on personnel if you are not equipped properly and if you are not um and uh, not motivated enough and a lot of that comes from your your personal morale and belief in your your, your cause and the and the men and women to your left and right and your leadership and political military leadership and so on and so forth um you know you very quickly just start start going down uh, now i don't think Russia will be any in any shape at all to um, to combat those things for reasons you've described. You said you, you you looked at the sort of strategic implications over the last few days while I was away. Well, I think I think looking at the tactical implications, I mean you you'll be hard put to get these people to fight properly from their trenches because it, by the sound of it, their logistic supply is is bad at the moment. It will be woeful when um, movement is restricted so feeding them correctly getting them adequate warm warm kits so they sleep well um you know, in the british military we said you know, minimum of four four hours horizontal uh, warm dry sleep is needed per night and and that rapidly <laughs> rapidly wears down a few nights of that i can assure you is, is not ideal but you know minimum four hours horizontal dry comfortable um i don't think russia is going to achieve that 
uh, in anything like the numbers they they need to advance. Um, I'm pretty sure they'll be hard pushed to do that to achieve that for for people to defend these lines that we see going up in the Donbass and and around Hezon and, and so forth. Now, whether Ukraine are able to train and and lead and equip their people sufficiently to generate the combat mass to overcome those defences, that's another thing entirely. I mean, even if you if you have double the number. Uh, of of Russian defenders, that's probably not good enough. We, you know, we say generally it's a three to one advantage required by any any attacking force that goes through the roof at least double, if not treble, when you start talking about urban combat and built up areas. So, you know, even if Ukraine have managed to supply or get supplies for for cold weather gear, it is it is another thing entirely to then say right now let's put together some. Um, uh, some offensive operations. I mean, just whilst we're on the subject, interestingly, Ben Wallace, the uh, UK's Defence Secretary, he was talking uh, yesterday in Parliament and he was saying about how um, he was talking, uh, one of the things he was talking about was the international fund, the monetary fund, the £600 million, worth about $600 million, give or take a few cents here and there, in non-lethal um, support to Ukraine and saying it's all going through the international donor cell based in Germany. This is a multinational cell um, staff predominantly by military, but a few civil servants in there as well. And they collect the, the requirements from Ukraine for non-military stuff and then try to match those with donors to get to pay for uh, generators um, to keep field hospitals going, medical stuff, warm kit, sleeping bags, all this kind of stuff. So um, there is a lot of focus on that at, at the moment, um, right down to to down to the individual soldier you know what what what's he and she going to be wearing because uh, because of the the detrimental effect of of winter on the individual let alone the vehicles and the and the wider systems thanks dom just quickly because i know francis is chafing at the bit to offer some historical context for this but just quickly do you think for, for all the reasons you've described uh, this is why Ukraine are prosecuting um, such ag- aggressive counterattacks at the moment, because the minute it all slows down, it'll be a lot harder to take back the, the land they want to liberate. I think that's partly there. I do. Um, I also think it's partly to do with their recent momentum, as in over the last few months after that sort of lightning advance up in the north r- around Kharkiv to the, and to the east there. Um, I think that there's st- Russia is still reeling from that. So I think I think Ukraine are, are trying to just squeeze the last few drops out of that before everything everything freezes up i think a a long hard winter will benefit russia more than ukraine at the moment um we can have a discussion about is that another reason why there's the risk uh, the threat to the dam in hezon because uh, if that were to go and the place was flooded uh which would then freeze does that does that suit russia more militarily um despite the loss of the ability to get over the river um but yes i, th- I think U- ukraine are, are using it are trying to trying to get in as much as they can before the weather really um, impacts both sides uh, almost almost uh, equally. It, it would it would favour the defender slightly more, I think, which is in, in my my analysis would be Russia here. Um, so yes, I think that I think they're a large part of, what, of why they're really trying to go for it um, is to get as much as they can before winter you know th- rolls a six. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Francis, would you like to provide some context? Sure. Well, I think it will be remiss to talk about winter in relation to Russia without speaking about the historical examples. I mean, of course, general winter, as the Russians have have, have known it for, for centuries now, is infamous in the annals of warfare, frost, snow, intractable mud. It saved its forces from total collapse multiple times uh, in the Great Northern War of 1707 when the Swedes invaded Russia. Of course, in Napoleon's invasion in 1812, the German onslaught of 1941. But of course, in these historical examples, the Russians were the defenders. In Ukraine, it's the reverse. But nonetheless, to Dom's point, I think Putin is relying on the weather coming to his rescue And it still could for reasons that I've talked about in the past and just sort of summarizing those briefly to to Dom's point, a bleak winter will almost certainly slow the Ukrainian advance, freezing the front lines and will create the false impression that Kyiv is losing momentum. But more significantly, it risks exposing the major fault line that's still dividing European powers, that of energy fragility. So As we've talked about in recent days, despite the united front being put forward, EU tensions are still very much simmering in the background over Germany's 200 billion euro energy support package. Spain, Belgium, France are all voicing misgivings. There's this sense that as things get increasingly challenging over the winter period, that it 
seemingly may be every man for himself, which, of course, has big ramifications. And indeed, Putin is relying on that. Um, and as I say, if this terrible winter hits, one can envisage a situation when European elites find the prospect of peace in Ukraine in the context of static front lines an increasingly attractive prospect, despite how strong for support for Ukraine remains amongst the populations of Europe themselves. As I said before, at the end of the day in democracies, uh, politicians are always looking at the economy and, and, and whatever foreign affair issues are, are going on, the old mantra, it's the economy, stupid, tends to come to the fore. And because they'll be thinking about election cycles, they will be concerned uh, very much so if people are, are suffering as a consequence of this. And it may well lead to a change of opinion. And indeed, I would argue that there needs to be more of, a, of an explanation by the political leaders of Europe as to why you know, we are facing these energy challenges this winter and to really articulate why it's a price worth paying. But as I say, that's a, a different discussion. But obviously, of course, we've spoken so much about Elon Musk's peace plan, suggesting that the Kremlin is seeking a way out. And I think that, as I say, that there is a that, that this is their strategy. Winter is the key strategy for them, is is, is thinking that as the tide will turn militarily, the tide will turn politically, that this will favour them and that the West will then be in a, and Ukraine will be in a position to want to negotiate. And as I say, as uncomfortable as it may sound, and I don't necessarily think this will be what happens, but winter may arm Putin with the political climate in which to, to get that peace plan. Thanks, Francis. Dom, you've been off a few days, but I know you had some uh, extra thoughts about the incident relayed by Ben Wallace uh, the other day in Parliament relating to a Russian uh, military plane letting loose a, a missile very close to a, a British um, spy plane. Can you talk a little bit about um, um, what you're thinking? Yeah, sure. I was, I was thinking about this as I was bobbing on the ogging over the last couple of days. So just to remind us, so this, this is the, the, the Black Sea. There was a, a British um, I-Star aircraft, intelligence, surveillance, target acquisition and reconnaissance, let's say spy plane, just for uh, for ease, um, a rivet joint, RC-135 rivet joint over the Black Sea in international airspace, which has been acknowledged by Russia. Um, two armed Russian Su-27 fighters went up to have a look. This is quite normal stuff. Shadowing each other happens uh, a lot. The Baltic air policing uh, based um, around around the Baltic, funnily enough, uh, is used to this, as is the Icelandic air police mission, NATO's mission there. Happens a lot around the north coast of, uh, of the UK. So shadowing each other is quite normal. Happens in the air, happens on the sea. Um, so no problem. Uh, but one one of the Su-27s released a missile. At the time, it was described as in the vicinity of the RAF rivet joint. Which I agree. In the vicinity. As a former pilot, I'd like to know a little bit more information than that. Um, and Ben Wallace told Parliament that the total the total interaction between the rivet joint and the, the two Su-27s was about 90 minutes. Now, this happened on uh, September the 29th. Ben Wallace told told Parliament yesterday that he had uh, communicated his concerns directly to his uh, Russian counterpart, Sergei Shoigu, and the, the Chief of the Defence Staff, British Chief of the Defence Staff, had similarly made made his, his opinions known to his opposite number uh, in Moscow. And Ben Wallace reiterated in, in his letter, he says that he made it clear the aircraft was unarmed in international airspace following a pre-notified flight path. Now, Russia acknowledged that it happened in international airspace and, and said after an investigation um, that um, that it was a technical malfunction. That's their words, technical malfunction of the Su-27. I mean, Su-27 is an, an old aircraft. Uh, we know that a lot of Russian equipment is not brilliantly well maintained. Um, however, I mean, you don't, they are, they're still airworthy they're still um they still are seen with uh, on a very regular basis so i don't think they're about to fall out of the sky ben wallace spoke to parliament yesterday updated parliament on a number of number of bits and pieces about ukraine and said that uh, and this is a direct quote quote our analysis concurs that it was due to a malfunction unquote and i thought that was really interesting that that he said malfunction russia says technical malfunction which might be dancing on the head of a pin but i i, just, I don't think i'm going down a rabbit hole here please Please tell me if you think I am. Now, I, I mean, I, I used to fly helicopters, right? So I'm not, not fast jets. But even I know that, that these things don't just come off the rails. Missiles don't come off the rails just um, just on a, on a whim. 
I mean, I cannot think of any incident where a missile undemanded by the pilot has come off the rails in the air. I know of two incidents where it happened on the ground, where it was deemed that the ground crew had failed to uh, connect with the, mis- the missiles um, in a proper manner. Some, some, There was a technical reason why that it was not fitted correctly. And then as the aircraft sort of accelerated down the runway on takeoff, the, it was assessed that the, the, the vibration, the extreme vibration as the aircraft was going down the, down the runway, caused the missiles to, to go off. So I know of two missiles that have come off the rails of an aircraft uh, on the ground. But I know, I know of none in the air. And, you know, there are multiple switches required. The pilot has to make a number of selections in order to get a missile away. Um, and basically the system of a, of a fighter pilot, uh, sorry, of a fighter, the system is designed... Um, to stop you releasing a missile rather than encouraging you to you have to you have to make a, a series of conscious decisions to, to to set to make the right selections on the switches before you can release anything for the very for the very simple reason that you don't want these things flying off just just by mistake so multiple switches are required if you're going to jettison stores like you know weapons if you're coming if you're coming back in um and you, you know, maybe you've got an engine problem or for whatever you need to jettison stores or weapons underwing tanks what have you there are fewer switches required but but still a, a whole process you need to go through to 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 jet, to get anything away from the aircraft so i'm not suggesting that there is no chance this was a technical malfunction and that um you know sukhoi su27 pilot a was flying along with pilot b and then suddenly whoosh um cockpit blooms as this thing fires off into the distance it might it might have happened um i don't i don't think so now from various people I've spoken to, um, it's become very apparent to me that there's a lot of equity here when it comes to the intelligence. So UK and and others, and I'm very rarely privy to any UK intelligence. In fact, basically not really. Um, and I'm even even less likely to be to be even a bit of ankle shown of international um, intelligence from partners. So. I'm not sure quite what happened here. However, I think it was, I think Ben Wallace was deliberate with his language when he did not say technical malfunction. So a malfunction. What? So what? What malfunction was it? The aircraft? Was it the systems? Was it the procedures? Was it? Was it the pilots? Let's have a look at the. Let's have a look at the pilots. We, we know they are um, less professional than, let's say, the, the Royal Air Force um, and other sort of comparable NATO NATO air forces. They're more volatile. Um, I don't think. British pilots, um, I, only, I only caution because I'm thinking about some old mates of mine, but I don't think British pilots would act or, or would behave the way that Russian pilots do. And as an example there, what am I talking about? Well, look at how they do their air-to-surface operations. Look at the accuracy that they, look at the effort that they obviously put into to firing their weapons accurately, which I don't think is a huge amount of effort. Look at the precision they go for. Are they doing the correct weapon to target matching? Are they, as in using the right weapon for the target they want to hit? Um, I don't think so, because we've seen a number of civilian areas get hit with no military value whatsoever, nowhere near anything of military value, and yet still these, these missiles are being released by aircraft. So I don't think the Russian pilots are are especially professional. Um, I'm suggesting, therefore, that maybe maybe the pilot was was mucking around in the aircraft, making a few switches, um, and, and it was just it was just an you know a hugely catastrophic mistake um now ben wallace says this was beyond visual range so i i mean i'm taking it that there were no contrails here it wasn't wasn't or the, the ambient conditions were not su- were such that there were no condensation trails coming from the back of the aircraft so you can't see the aircraft i'm beyond about 10 miles you're just not going to see a fighter you probably wouldn't see a rivet joint actually at you know 10 miles ish they are although they're massive when they're rolling down the runway next to you um they're not that big in the old uh in the in the I don't subscribe to the big sky theory. I don't bother looking out the cockpit. Nothing's going to hit you. However, these things are quite small in the grand scheme of things. But uh, beyond 10 miles, so what I'm saying is you're, you're not really going to see them. So I don't think the weapon was was uh, visually laid. I don't think it's a heat seeker. Would it have been a radar? Uh, would it have been would it have locked on by radar? I doubt it because I don't think the rivet joint released any countermeasures. I haven't had that for, for definite, but people I've spoken to were were not warm to that suggestion at all so i don't think they are that the rc135 released any countermeasures that would that would then have to defeat an incoming missile so i think that i think this i think the missile just came off the rails um probably because somebody was was mucking around um rather than anything more than that now why why do we think um 
why do I think that that Ben Wallace was quick to, albeit with that sort of linguistic dance, was quite quick to um, to pour cold water on suggestions that this was a provocation from Russia, this was an an escalation, this was a deliberate act that the system had required. This is where it comes back into that, the bit I was saying earlier about, I think there's some international equity here, um, which I'm not privy to. And I just, but I just wonder if after this, after this event, perhaps the, either the aircraft itself, the RC-135 or any other assets listening to Russian electronic communications, um, heard a lot of chatter saying, what the hell are you doing, you idiot? Um, what air pilot doing? Or words to that effect. Um, that might have indicated that there was a, a shock through the system. This was not centrally planned. This is one one person who's now probably polishing a few uh, you know a few rusty tail wheels or something and not, or not being allowed in the air again. So I, I don't think it was a a hugely um, impactful event. I don't think this leans into deterrence. Uh, I we knew they were there. The, the, the NATO planes that are flying know the Russians are there because they shadow them, and equally they know we're there. So there's nothing they didn't need to fire a weapon to say, you know, we're, we're here, comrade. You know, just 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 to remind you, they don't need to do that. So I don't think this was a deterrence message. I don't think it was centrally planned by um, by the Kremlin or by the Russian Air Force. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going for as I normally do um, in life generally. Um, it's uh, a cock up, not conspiracy. I think this was somebody in the in the aircraft mucking around, making a few switches, and just 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 you know, not concentrating. And bef- before you know it, he's just done, he's gone one step too far, and the thing's gone off the rails. Um, now, all of that is conjecture from me, based on a number of conversations that were hazy because some people didn't want to talk too closely about the intelligence backing up their view. Um, but I think the the big takeaway is that Ben Wallace used the language of malfunction rather than technical malfunction, which is the Russian MOD's view. Um, however, was was keen. Uh, if if he didn't downplay it, he certainly didn't go overboard. He didn't make more of it than um, than he might have done if he'd wanted to, to send another message back. Uh, but you know, all all open to to conversation. Very happy to continue that chat on uh, on social media or email what have you um because you know i've been very very wrong before i've just got a question for you dom which is that if the worst had happened and the british plane had been shot down what would the protocols the lines of command have have been what would have kicked in would there have been a immediate military response from another plane in the air to shoot down that russian plane or would there have been emergency maneuvers and 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 sort of consultations on on, amongst the high command as to how to respond just wondering how much flexibility a pilot has in that situation well nobody would have shot back for starters because there were no escorting aircraft now since this incident uh, ben Wallace briefly grounded the the 135 um, and for a few days it's back up again now um, operating you can have a look at all these things they're on flight tracker you can you can see the the racetrack circuits that they're doing around the Black Sea you can see what they're up to or rather you can see where they are rather than what, what they're up to um, and since they've gone back in the last few days they've now each river joint is is uh, escorted by a couple of typhoons RF typhoons. Um, so, th- so it might be a different response now. Um, and I, I don't know if that will last for very long. But at the time, there was nothing that could have fired back. The, the RC-135 has got countermeasures, as I said, to have a go at the, the, any missile or any threat coming its way, but it can't do anything against the, the aggressor. Now, if it had been shot down, that would have been um, that would have been very serious indeed. There would have, I imagine, an immediate meeting of the North Atlantic Council um, at NATO and certainly the, the, the military um, the military committee would have got together, and I, I think they would have. I, I mean, you know, it's in Article Five territory, and an attack against one is attacking against all. However, um, the people that make these decisions are are generally sensible and and cool headed, and would leave room for was it a horrendous mistake? There would have been a lot of chatter, direct chatter um, with the Kremlin. And, all, and through all the other diplomatic channels. And I would have thought, um, so let me go back a stage. So Russia responded, uh, Ben Wallace sent his letter, we're told, I think around um, the 3rd of October, and in, re- in response to this incident on the 29th of September, and we're told got a response on the 10th. 
Um, now, Russia might not have responded. They might. They're, they're quite quite used to doing the, um, the sort of extended middle digit response. So they might not have bothered responding. Um, they did in this in this instance, which I think speaks of how seriously they took the incident. By that, so I extrapolate from that and think if something very serious had happened, there'd been loss of life and an aircraft had been shot down, then there would have been a there would have been a very direct response. I think it's interesting that even in the midst of this war, which they are categorising as a war against NATO because they're losing against Ukraine, how can they lose against Ukraine? They can't. They can only lose against NATO. So this is a war against NATO, apparently. Even in the midst of this war, um, then there is still direct communication between defence chiefs and uh, as in political and military chiefs as well. And so I think. That line is still open um, and that line would have been used very quickly and at a very, very high level um, if they'd been if it had been shot down. I I just question whether or not that would have been seen as the immediate uh, the immediate response would have been would have been kinetic in nature, i.e. firing munitions back at Russia. It might have been ramping up these patrols ramping up the the escorting duties ramping up stuff in the in the sea as well um i i don't know if there would have been an, an immediate military response to to uh, from nato directly against russia um yeah i mean that would be a, that would be a very interesting well, i mean and i'm pausing because you know putin loves pushing the edges we're seeing that at the moment a slight segue here sorry apologies we see that at the moment in this and what he's doing against national infrastructure um, in Ukraine and and elsewhere, I think the Nord Stream attack. I, I I hold Russia responsible for that. I think what he's what he's doing is just seeing where he can go, and I wonder if he's building up this. See where the tolerance is for attacks against civilian and civilian infrastructure, um, which is why I'm very worried about the dam. Um, but I wonder if if in the in the absence of a hard military response from NATO, if the one three five had been shot down. Putin might have might have taken the message from that. Aha! I can do that. I can take the odd uh, spy plane out and X, Y, and Z. So NATO would probably have factored that into their response, and they might have felt that they do need a a comparable um, kinetic, as in shooting down something, killing something, response. Um, so a long winded way of saying I, d- I don't know, Francis, but I, th- I think those are the factors that they would have been um, uh, they would consider would have considered if it happened and might yet consider if it uh, if it anything similar were to happen in the future. Well, thank you very much for that, Dom. That was, a, a, I think, a great insight into understanding how people in the military might be thinking about these things and the kind of considerations and thoughts that are going on at, at, a, at a higher level. So thank you very much for that. There's just one thing I, I want us to talk about before we move to our final thoughts today on Friday. Uh, Francis, there's been some um, some, re- some really, really awful news, really, fr- from the UK to do with uh, the Ukrainian um, refugees who, who came to Britain. Can you talk us through what's happened? Yes, well, we understand that nearly a thousand Ukrainians have been made homeless as British families who offered up their houses are struggling with the cost of living crisis. New figures show Ukrainian families have been made homeless under the Homes for Ukraine scheme by the end of September following its launch in February. This represents a 40% rise on the 680 at the end of August. Now, to stress, we're not saying homeless as if they're on the streets. I'm saying that that the home they were allocated is no longer available to them and they've been therefore been found alternative accommodation by councils. But the local authorities are warning that there is a significant risk of more Ukrainians being made homeless as the six-month deadline for sponsorship looms for the families. And indeed, I'll quote from the chairman of the local government association, Jamie, James Jamieson, quote, council sponsors and Ukrainian guests all need to know what the options are as we get closer to the end of the six-month initial placements period so that they can start planning now. Now, I just want to underline here that this is not indicative of a change in public opinion about Ukraine. As I say, this should be very much framed in the cost of living uh, crisis here in Britain, which is that you can imagine that even though the government is helping to fund people to support the Ukrainian families, things are going to get more difficult, that food prices are going up, energy prices are going up, and some people who have are trying to do the right thing realise that actually the right thing is that they can't afford to support people in the way they deserve. Many of the Ukrainians who are here in Britain are young mothers with young children. And you can imagine if you're in a situation where you don't feel that you can help warm a house properly, that you might start saying, look, I, I want to support you, but I'm not in a position to do so. I was at the uh, Welcome Centre for Ukrainian Ukrainian 
refugees yesterday, and I'll talk about that a little bit more about that next week. But that was very much the message that I was hearing, speaking to to the people there, that this shouldn't be seen as in any way a, a shift in in public opinion, in any way people being cold and booting people out of the house. Which I know that when you initially hear that, that's how it sounds. It's not that at all. It's just a consequence of the kind of economic pressures that we're currently seeing here in Britain. And indeed, uh, we'll look more into this. But I imagine this will be something that will be echoed uh, across the continent as well, due to the to the challenges of of the moment. And of course, as I said earlier on, this is something that Putin is relying on for his broader winter strategy in the months ahead. Thank you very much for that, for that Francis. And uh, you know, I just say from from our point of view, of course, we know that lots of influential people listen to this podcast. And if you have any way to to help these people, please do. It's, it's these people are our guests, and we should do everything we can to support them while they're here. So thank you very much, Francis, for your um, for, for your reporting there. Uh, Francis Francis Stanley, what are you thinking of over the next few days? What would you like to leave our listeners with over the weekend? I spoke a couple of weeks ago about the the need not to give up on all of the Russian population. I was framing that in the context of, of seeing some people on Twitter calling all of Russian people orcs and calling them subhumans and saying that the only way forward is to punish them and to crush Russia and, and all of this kind of rhetoric. And I'd pointed then to the fact that there are still opposition figures in Russia who are being suppressed violently, obviously murdered in the past uh, as a consequence of the threat that they are perceived as posing to the regime. And I just wanted to underline that. And in that context, I just wanted to raise a small story, but one that uh, nonetheless, I think should be something we should be thinking about very seriously in in in, in the context of this war. So uh, the uh, taken a, a radio station called Echo of Moscow, a Russian um, radio station was taken off air shortly after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. One can imagine Imagine why that any liberal radio station was a threat to the regime in those immediate days and weeks afterwards. But they have found a new home in Berlin where they are now resuming their fight back against the, the, the propaganda machine in Russia. As I say, they're considered one of the last independent voices in Russia and many of the employees were forced to flee. But as I say, they've now restarted broadcast on an app. It's simply called Echo. Um, and the, the, the founder says it works just like the radio. You boot up the app and, and then you can listen to what they're broadcasting. It claims that the app has, is fast becoming one of the top downloads in Russia. Now, that's not been independently verified, but, um, but nonetheless, if it's true, I think it speaks to the fact that there is a thirst for, for, for alternative sources uh, of, of information. Indeed, I know that this podcast is one that, that, that the Russians do, Russians do listen to. So um, there is an appetite there. And as I say, I think we just need to think about this. This is rather than giving up on Russia, which some very very, very um, uh, prominent people have sought to do in their remarks on Twitter. Uh, we need to be thinking about this kind of work, the kind of work that was done during the Cold War to spread information around the Soviet Union, free ideas, and and to combat misinformation. It's this kind of work that we in the West should be supporting. And, and I wish that we were doing perhaps a little bit more than we have. Earlier on, in the war, there was a lot of talk about completely cutting Russia off in terms of, of economics. And indeed, I, I think that's been vitally important for putting increasing pressure on Putin personally and on the Russian state. But to cut off all culture, all information, all of those ideas of, of, of things bleeding in uh, as things become particularly more difficult in Russia in the months ahead, I think would be a huge miscalculation because people will suddenly wake up to, to what this war is doing to them personally. And that's the moment when they might be willing to listen to alternative voices. So I just wanted to underline this small, but I don't think insignificant story is my final thought. Thank you, Francis. Uh, Dom, uh, again, welcome back. It's really good to have you back. What are your final thoughts ahead of the weekend? Um, yeah, it's got to be the dam, I think. A bit, bit obvious, but I think the, I think that's where we need to look. I think the, um, the chat around it specifically, and, and the point I made just a moment ago, the, the effort in the last couple of months by Russia to test the test the limits both inside Ukraine and the international community supporting Ukraine for attacks on civilian infrastructure has brought us to this point in the in the absence of a, a tactical nuclear weapon or no a nuclear weapon strike i mean this uh, if the dam were to be destroyed it would just be absolutely horrific um, but what would the response be from the West? Because it's not a nuclear strike and you know the, all the rest of it. Um, so we need to keep an eye on that. Um, I, I implore people to, to use multiple sources for their information, um, including 
as in not just this podcast, please look elsewhere. Have a look at uh, the Twitter site at GeoConfirmed. So all one word, but capital G, capital C, but you'll find it at GeoConfirmed. That's one of the sites I look at to um, to have a look at what's going on on the ground. They're very good with their imagery and analysis, I think. But uh, but again, don't take that as your sole source. But I think we have to be have to be concerned about about the uh, the implications of an attack on the dam. Bearing in mind that Ukraine have been have been shelling it, or have been shelling the approaches to it, and some of the wider um, wider parts of the estate, if you like, um, in an attempt to deny access across the dam to heavy Russian military vehicles, both to resupply um, the, the the troops north and west of the Dnipro, and cut off any uh, any uh, retreating troops. Um, so you know, look around and you'll see lots of chat from Russian sources saying, "Well, you know, Ukraine have been shelling the dam for months. They they've been shelling the." the area of the dam that is absolutely correct but if you look at what they've been trying to hit they've, they've not been trying to destroy the dam i mean they've been trying to deny it as a as a passage across the river um two very subtly different things um russia when it comes to misinformation doesn't do subtle so i implore everyone listening to this to to to, to embrace the subtle yeah not not a great soundbite but i'll um i'll i'll be embracing the subtle this weekend Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash audio. You can also listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter to make sure you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app and... If you have a moment, leave a review, as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And we're especially interested to hear where you're listening from around the world. To our listeners on YouTube, sometimes there is a bit of delay between broadcast and upload. So if you do want to hear an episode as soon as it is available, do subscribe to a podcast app. Or check the Ukraine The Latest page on the Telegraph website. Ukraine The Latest was today produced by Isabel Bouchard and today on Twitter, Claire Hubble. Just before you go, listeners, I wanted to tell you about another podcast you might like from our foreign desk here at The Telegraph. It's called How to Be a Dictator by our brilliant China correspondent, Sophia Yan, who you will have heard on Ukraine The Latest quite a few times. Here's a sneak peek. Right now, the whole world is watching China. It's the 20th Party Congress, a twice-in-a-decade political set-piece that reveals the outcome of China's very secretive leadership selection. And there is, of course, only one man in the running. Xi Jinping. This is seismic. After the death of Chairman Mao Zedong, there has been a two-term limit on Chinese leaders. No more. Xi is on the cusp of effectively becoming ruler for life. Understanding him has never been more important. They turned this place into a hell. We're in Beijing, we, we see business people got disappear by the state all the time. I mean, everything is protected and you're under constant watch. But reporting on Xi, well, that might be my toughest assignment yet. I've come into a bathroom now to try to upload all these files in case on my way out, I get stopped and searched and they try to delete these. Despite 10 years in power, he remains a puzzle, one we know very little about beyond official propaganda. Who is he, really? How has he managed to build a cult of personality? What kind of a leader has this made him? And what does that mean for all of us? China under Xi doesn't like these sorts of questions. Don't touch me! Don't touch me! But I'm going to try and ask them anyway. I'm Sophia Yan, and this is How to Become a Dictator. Coming soon from The Telegraph.